Hi, I'm Jay Phelan. Let's talk about some biology. Today we're going to talk about uh, an extension to Mendelian genetics. We're going to be looking at the question we've been looking at, which is how are genotypes translated into phenotypes? But what we're going to do is we're going to consider the fact that Mendel's genetics, the version he talked about, the version he discovered, was fairly straightforward and relatively simplistic. He looked at seven different traits, but all the traits that he looked at, whether it was wrinkled versus round, green versus yellow, and so on, they were all coded for by a single gene that had two alleles, that had one completely dominant, one completely recessive allele, and there were no environmental effects on the ultimate expression in the phenotype. So that worked for all the traits he looked at, but we could probably think of a lot of traits in the world that clearly don't have that type of pattern of inheritance. So we're going to start building a more complex model of how genotypes can get turned into phenotypes. And today we're going to look at incomplete dominance and codominance. Classic textbook example for incomplete dominance comes from a type of flower called the, the four o'clock or four o'clock flowers. And you'll see with these that you have some that are white, you have some that are red, but you also have some that are pink. So how can that be? If we have a dominant or recessive and it's just a single gene and there are two alleles, how do you end up with three different phenotypes? We see this also, here's a little close up of a variety of different ones. Sometimes the pink ones have some combination of white and pink, but the white tend to be completely white, the red tend to be completely red. We see this in snapdragons also, uh, where you'll have completely red flowers, completely white flowers, and some that are a mixture. So let's look at how this is inherited. We see red, we see white, we see pink. We wanna figure out how do you get those. When we cross red, with red, and these are true breeding, meaning, meaning that anytime you cross them, you always get the same outcomes. We get red flowers. When you cross white with white, you always get white flowers. That would be true for a trait like any other Mendelian trait with uh, one dominant allele, one recessive. However, in this case, when you cross the red flowers with the white flowers, you get pink flowers. If there were uh, dominance in the typical way, it would either be red because that allele was dominant or it would be white because that allele was dominant. Here instead, we see some combination. Now we can plot this out on a Punnett square, which helps us see what's going on. We put the female up top, her gametes, and in this case, we, we call them the uh, C for color. Uh, with a W on top, meaning that she produces white flowers and an R as a superscript for the father. He produces red flowers. And we see that all the offspring are pink. That would be the case here uh, with this setup when they're all homo heterozygous. So you have to note that we don't use uppercase or lowercase letters to denote an allele if we don't have complete dominance. So instead, in cases like these, we will commonly use a big letter for the gene and then some superscript for the version of it. This will also be true, we'll see later on, if you have more than two alleles for a trait. So you could have numbers, for instance, you know, C1, C2, C3, C4, and so on, because there are a lot of genes that have more than two alleles. In this case, all of the genotypes of, from this cross are heterozygous, and all of the phenotypes are pink flowers. But then what happens when you cross the pink flowers? If you cross pink with pink flowers, this is doing a heterozygous cross. Still use our Punnett square. We're making sure because, you know, I'm telling you how the mode of inheritance works, but we wouldn't know this. We might just be doing these crosses with the plants uh, and then trying to intuit it from that. But here we're going to show heterozygous mother, heterozygous father. We cross them. And from a cross like this, you'll see that if a C with an R superscript uh, sperm fertilizes C with an R superscript egg, then you're going to be CR, CR, two reds, uh, alleles. That's going to be a red plant. One quarter of the time, we expect to see this. We expect to see uh, a W and an R 
half the time because you could get an R from the father and a W from the mother, or you can get a W from the father and an R from the mother. So two out of every four or half the time you're going to get pink flowers and heterozygous individuals. And one out of four times you're going to inherit the W allele from the mother and the father. We don't call it the dominant because it isn't. It's just the other allele, but you get two copies and you're white. So this would be the ratio of the phenotypes. We'd also see the ratio here of the genotypes. It's helpful in a case like this to, to figure out what's going on with these two alleles. It's something like this. C is a color gene. It codes for instructions for how to produce a pigment, in this case, a red pigment. And if you have the allele C with a superscript R, it means that you carry the instructions for how to produce red pigment. If you carry a C with a W, that means you have the allele that codes for no pigment. And then what happens is if you get two of the red pigment coding genes, you produce a lot of it. If you get two of the white uh, versions of the allele that code for no pigment, you get no pigment, so they end up white. And in the case of the heterozygote, you get some of the red pigment instructions, but not as much as if you were homozygous for it. So it's sort of uh, like a volume knob. You get one copy, so you only get half as much of the production of the pigment, and that's how the, this works. Many, many traits in humans and other organisms turn out to be inherited in the same fashion, that uh, there's some amount you get. And the more you have of the gene, one dose versus two dose, the more you're going to show it in the phenotype. Here's an example in humans where we see this in action. It has to do with uh, metabolizing alcohol that, that we drink. So when a human consumes alcohol, it doesn't matter whether it's a beer, wine, or something else, the molecule is ethanol, small molecule. It's going to get into your digestive tract, get absorbed, get into your bloodstream, and then your body breaks it down. Our body breaks it down in a pretty straightforward two-step process. You have the ethanol, and it gets converted into acetaldehyde by alcohol dehydrogenase. That's just what it sounds like. Uh, it starts with an alcohol dehydrogenase, takes off a hydrogen. Then you have a second step. The acetaldehyde gets modified into acetic acid because of the actions of an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase. And that's how the process works. Then the acetic acid can be uh, excreted out of the body and so on. People have the effects of, of inebriation when their body can't clear it out quickly enough. Now you may have heard that some people process alcohol differently. Some people have an easier or harder time physiologically with metabolizing alcohol. And there is a trait that's referred to as fast flushing and another version of it called slow flushing that acknowledges the fact that 50% of all Asians carry an allele that codes for an inactive form of aldehyde dehydrogenase. Now think about what's going to go on here. You've got this two-step process. So first the ethanol gets broken down uh, by alcohol dehydrogenase into acetaldehyde. But the second step, acetaldehyde into acetic acid, if your aldehyde dehydrogenase doesn't function, then what's going to happen? The acetaldehyde is going to build up and build up and build up. Acetaldehyde turns out to be very uh, toxic to your body. When you have an increase in this acetaldehyde, it's not going to make you more drunk. The ethanol does. But if you're, you are carrying this inactive form of the aldehyde dehydrogenase, that doesn't stop the conversion of ethanol into acetaldehyde. So you get a buildup of acetaldehyde and you end up with a rapid pulse, you end up with sweating, you end up with uh, skin flushing, your face gets red, and nausea and vomiting. So not very pleasant. We call this fast flushing because within just minutes of consuming an alcoholic beverage, someone who carries two versions of the non-functioning aldehyde dehydrogenase allele, uh, very quickly that happens. Their face gets red and they feel sick. If you only carry one though, so think back to the snapdragons, the four o'clocks, if you only carry one, then you have one version that codes for the instructions of a non-functioning aldehyde dehydrogenase. Out of 374 amino acids, one of them is different, but it no longer functions, uh, the enzyme. And if you have one version that functions, your body's producing aldehyde dehydrogenase. It's out there. It can grab onto the acetaldehyde, modify it into acetic acid, but you don't have as much. So your ability to process ethanol and 
get it out of your body and to process the acetaldehyde is good, but it's not as effective as if you have two copies. So individuals who have uh, one version, it's called slow flushing because they are able to process some of it, but not all of it. So that would be an example of incomplete dominance in action. So we define it though as a heterozygous, heterozygous phenotype differing from the homozygotes because there's some variation in the amount of uh, a gene product produced. In the case of codominance, we have situations where you have a trait. In this case, we'll talk about the trait that uh, is responsible for sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. There are two alleles, and one of them we'll call uh, HB for hemoglobin with an A as a superscript. That codes for a, the, the typical hemoglobin. The HBS is a sickling form of the hemoglobin, which means that when it gives up oxygen at tissue in the body, uh, it has four spots that it can hold oxygen. When it gives those up, it causes the molecule to change its conformation, and it causes the red blood cell in which the hemoglobin occurs to curve up and, and lead to a, a sickled shape where it has sharp edges and where the cells stick together more. Given that there are two alleles for this one gene, you have three different phenotypes that are possible. You can be homozygous for the A, you can be homozygous for the S, or you can be heterozygous. And if you have two copies of the A, every hemoglobin version you produce is the same and it functions typically, doesn't lead to a sickled cell when it gives up the oxygen. If you have two versions of the S, then all of the hemoglobin is of this type and every time it gives the oxygen to the tissue, you end up with a sickling form and that leads to sickle cell disease. However, the heterozygote, you have a little bit of each and those individuals don't have as many sickled cells as someone who is homozygous for the HBS, but they produce some. Here's a picture showing a typical uh, red blood cell that comes from uh, hemoglobin HBA, HBA. The one on the right is a sickling form, either HBA, HBS, or HBS, HBS. In blood vessels, what happens is that typically regular blood, red blood cells can move through, no problem. When they have that sickled shape uh, and they become more sticky, they can glom together and they can block off a blood vessel and that can cause a uh, problem with delivering oxygen. It can lead to extreme pain, uh, primarily in these situations where the cells become sickled after they've given up their oxygen. So in situations where there is uh, high oxygen consumption, you're gonna to lead to a higher percentage of your cells sickling and more the, the physical problems. Here is a picture showing uh, a blood sample where some of the cells are sickling and some are in the, the typical round shape, uh, characteristic of someone who is heterozygous here. Now, you can imagine then that a person with a sickle cell trait, and by sickle cell trait, we mean a carrier. They have HBA, HBS, they're heterozygous. They're not always going to show any of the symptoms, but in some cases they are. So you should be able to figure out what that is based on what percentage of their blood cells are gonna be sickling and under what conditions do they sickle. But in the end, we will define codominance as a situation where the heterozygous phenotype, again, like incomplete dominance, differs from the homozygotes. But in this case, we say that it's got characteristics from both of the other phenotypes. Uh, so you have something from the sickling uh, allele coding for those cells. You have something, something from the non-sickling uh, allele coding for those cells as well. And they're pretty similar to each other, just depending on how closely you look to see, is there some continuation of how much of the gene product or is there just, they're two different things and we can see them both. It's one of my favorite pictures in biology. Uh, I thought it was a nice uh, shirt representation of co-dominance because you see uh, manifestation in the phenotype of the boy, uh, I think it's a boy, uh, from both the mother's genotype and the father's genotype. Uh, I guess it's not a genotype, shirtotype maybe. All right, there we have it. A more realistic model uh, for some situations by which we can understand how a genotype can get converted into a phenotype. That's it.